So if you're looking at buying your first silencer, today I wanna to give you seven things that you really need to know about this process before you get into it. And of course, I want to help you if you're looking at doing this, and then that way you have the information that you need to make this a much easier process along the way. Of course, I wanna hear from y'all because these aren't the only seven things you need to know, but I think they're most important. But again, I wanna hear from y'all down in the comments below after the video. What do you think are some important things to remember when buying a suppressor for the first time? Or leave those down below. And if you like what I do, consider subscribing. Let's go and get into it. First thing I wanna talk about is the legality of this. Well, a lot of people don't know that silencers are actually legal to own. So this is considered an NFA item. And the very first thing that you have to do in order to get this is you gotta pay for it, of course, but you also have to go through a series of background checks in order to do this. Now, the first step that you wanna take is you want to go to a reputable FFL your local gun dealer that has a silencer shop kiosk. They're gonna be able to take your fingerprints, fill out all your information, do your photo, all of that stuff right there basically from the kiosk and it's gonna make this process a heck of a lot easier. From there, once you buy that suppressor, then you will get a $200 tax stamp. Now silencer shop actually sells these as well and that basically allows you to take transfer of the suppressor once you get the approval from your gun dealer or whatever to you and you become the legal owner of that item, but you've got to have that tax stamp. Now you may think, oh, $200, that's a lot of money. It's actually been $200 since the thirties when they first started regulating these things. So back then it was a heck of a lot more than what it is today. But no matter what suppression you buy, you're gonna have to pay that $200 tax stamp. That's just kind of the way it is. Now, of course you wanna know what kind of suppressor should you get? Now, there are a lot of different options out there. A lot of companies make these from caliber specific to multi-function suppressors like what you see right here. I went with the uh, Silencer Co. Omega 36M because it is a multi-function. And so I can take it from this 762 by 39 to my 308, nine millimeter, you know, 5.56, five, and use it across all these different platforms. Another cool thing about the 36 is I actually have the ability to take these front baffles off because it's threaded and actually shorten up the can if I want to run this on a pistol or CZ Bren 2 MS, which is a pistol as well. It'll look a little bit better. It won't function as well but it will actually uh, look a little bit better. So I love the functionality of this specific silencer, but of course that's something you're gonna have to come up with as well. Now, just so you know, there's not just one can you're probably going to want to own. You're going to want to own multiple. Once you buy one, it's kind of like getting a tattoo or even buying a gun. You're not just going to own one. So um, you can definitely pick one that is multi-caliber, but just remember that you're probably going to end up buying more anyways. Another thing that you want to remember is that if you're going to buy one can and you know it's going to be your only can for a while, make sure you buy the same muzzle device between all the different guns that you want to run it on. And so like in my case, I can take this MCX Spear LT, you know, my SCAR 17 and 308, my CZ Bren 2 and 7.62x39, and I can attach this suppressor to each one of these and not have to worry about it. Another thing that I want to talk about is if we step down, right? So. Mm -hmm. Obviously we can't go up, but we can step down. Uh, your 46M, your 36M, those are really good options for that. Yeah, so most 30 caliber cans are rated to 300 Remington Ultra Mag, uh, RUM. So you can shoot 300 Win Mag through it, you can shoot 300 Blackout through it, and you can go down. So a 30 caliber can, you shoot 5.56 through it. There's not a whole lot of difference because it kind of makes up for itself with internal volume and hole size. Hole size is not as important as internal volume in my experience. The engineers may disagree with me, but it's just what I hear out there shooting. Um, so when you have a 30 caliber can on a 5.56 gun, it's usually a little bit larger, which gives you more internal volume to account for the hole size being bigger. Um, if I spun you around and shot both, 
they would tone would be different. Yeah. But you couldn't pinpoint that's a thirty caliber can, that's right. a five five six can on which is which. It's right. just so for that reason, most people go with thirty caliber cans because it gives you more versatility. One thing that you have to keep in consideration too is if you're taking a rifle can, which like the thirty six is, or the old hybrids, which did not come apart. Uh, you're hanging a rifle can with a lot more weight off of the end of a pistol. It's a lot more work for the spring. It's a lot more work for the action to try to cycle. So it's not going to perform well on every handgun. Some yeah. handguns do better than others, like that Beretta there, for instance, <clears throat> because the barrel doesn't come down and uh, have to move as much. Um, the 36, you can shorten up, so that takes off a little bit of weight for it. For sure. And uh, I, I don't think good. it's as fun. Um, you know, it's no, been years it's since not. I've actually... Mm -hmm you know, reviewed suppressors, but I don't remember it being as fun as mm -hmm. you think it is. Like when you see John out Wick or something. Gun. Yeah, out of a handgun. Hand yeah. when, when you see John Wick or one of these badass movies, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Awesome, and then man. you get out there and you're like, holy crap, that's a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. So you may change your mind. I mean, it's cool, but you may change your mind. And of course there are things that you want to consider whenever you're running these on pistol specifically. Do you have heights that will actually clear that? Or do you have an optic that'll pretty much take care of that as well? Um, but it's primarily the weight when you run it on a pistol. Yeah, with a pistol I thought about, it was a nine millimeter pistol can was my first one. And I quickly decided that it was not as much fun on a handgun as it is <laughs> on a rifle or a sub gun yeah. for a couple of reasons. It gets hot. You can't put it in a holster. Sure. You got to be careful where you put it down. Your suppressor height sights have to be tall enough to clear and look over the can. Still doesn't do a good job. I don't care how tall the sights are. So right. you want to run a red dot on it. And it's just, it's cool for a little bit, but then if you put it on a pistol caliber carbine or a rifle, that's when you start having a lot of fun. Exactly. Now, another thing you want to keep in mind is about your brakes and about flash hiders, whatever kind of muzzle device you're going to run on here. If you're going to run a muzzle brake, right, that's ported on the sides, maybe ported on the top and has, you know, it's solid underneath, you have to have that thing timed. Now, it's not necessarily a hard process, but you can screw it up fairly quickly, especially when you're trying to shim it and make sure you get it in the right orientation the first time. Uh, so it is something you maybe want to take to somebody that knows how to do it. This is actually what I did. Uh, the guys at Allied Arms actually helped me out with this. So I made sure that it was timed correctly and I could film it at the same time. So you guys kind of have an idea of what to expect when you're timing these things. Right, with some of the SIG barrels, they don't come with a 90 degree shelf uh, on the barrel. So there's not enough meat for the muzzle devices to really lock up to the back of it to settle out so they, they can kind of get cockeyed. So you've got to get a taper collar adapter. A few companies sell them, Lantac, um, HB Industries I believe has one. But it's got a shoulder on it which fits over the SIG taper and gives you a 90 degree shelf. That 90 degree shelf gives enough, enough meat for the muzzle device to back up to to bottom out. To get it to time right and like a flash hider, three prong flash hiders most often have no specific orientation so it doesn't matter where they sit. A muzzle device while in the suppressor doesn't matter but if you're going to shoot it without a can you don't really want this like here because you're going to be blowing dirt all over the place. Uh, you can also push over your impact shims. They're going to be varying thicknesses. You get to play a fun game of stacking the shims in order to make it where your orientation lines up correctly right about there when you go to tighten it because they do have a little bit of squeeze. They don't have as much squeeze as a... Uh, crush washer? Crush washer, that's the word. They do have a little bit of give, but not nearly as much. So when you go to stack them, put the thick ones towards the barrel and the thick ones towards the muzzle device. If you use the thin ones on the ends, they have a better probability to distort to roll to tear and um, I found that using them in the middle makes it where they just kind of slide across each other so you stack them up until you get your orientation correctly take it away add to until you get something that looks close to that orientation right there uh, that's kind of snug tight, then you're going to go the extra degrees and orientate it up and down. Before you want to do that, you want to use some sort of thread locker. There's a lot of torque that's applied to the suppressors, so you don't want the whole muzzle device to come off with the can. You're going to wipe off your extra uh, thread locker so that it's not ugly and gunks up everything. 
with some of them, especially with a taper like this, it's going to be hard to get a normal crescent wrench uh, in between here to tighten it uh, because it don't fit. Um, so sometimes you can get lucky and get an AR wrench in there. If not, you can take a screwdriver or a piece of bar rod and put it in between the slats in your brake and tighten it over. It's not the best way to do it because you will ding up the inside of it, but sometimes it's the only way to do it. That's just the option that I went with. There's so many different types. You could go with flash hiders that don't have to be timed and will still accept the suppressor that you have. So it just depends on what you have. I like the functionality of the muzzle brake with 7.62x39 with 308. And so that's why I went with that. But if I was running this maybe on a 5.56 gun, I wouldn't need to utilize the brake as much as I would a flash hider. And so in that case, hey, doesn't have to be timed makes it much easier for you, but it's definitely something you want to remember. Now those muzzle brakes, it doesn't matter so much if they're not oriented correctly when you're running it suppressed, because all those gases are going to come into the baffles of the silencer. But when you're running an unsuppressed, that's where you want to retain the benefits of that muzzle brake and you don't want to be kicking dirt up everywhere and all that kind of stuff. So just make sure you time it correctly the first time. It'll save you a lot of trouble and you can shoot your gun unsuppressed with no issues. Um, and so that's a big thing too, buying from a reputable company. Buying from a reputable company is really, really, really important. I won't spend my money because you're married to this thing for life. Yeah. Uh, it is possible to sell and trade suppressors. No one does it because you, the price of a new one is not substantially different than what you're going to try to get a used one for, so it becomes worthless. It's a lot of work. Who holds the money? What shop do you use? You're doubling nine months for wait yeah. time. So just go out and buy a new one, spend $200 more and you keep it forever right um going back to what you said about uh you're gonna have to tip <laughs> i have lost it now um talking about the um the quality of the cans ah, and who you buy the yeah, cans yeah. from quality of the can is very important so i won't waste my money on it because you are married to it for anything longer than a company has proved itself for at least two years um a lot of times you are spending money on the brand and the insurance that they will be there to warranty your product should, product should you have an issue. Uh, sure. That's a lot of it. Uh, material is another thing that you spend money on. Uh, there is a lot of science that goes into the baffles and the placement and the spacing and everything, and I'm not smart enough to figure all that out, but there are guys sure. with computers that do do it. Yeah. But the big expense usually is material and the fact that that company stands behind their product. Perfect. Another thing to know is you can travel across state lines with your suppressor and there's no paperwork that's needed here. And so 42 out of 50 states allow you to have a silencer. Those other eight states are the states you would imagine would not allow you to have them. And so there you go. Uh, no special paperwork is needed. Now, this does not apply to machine guns or short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns. You actually have to fill out a separate form with the ATF prior to wherever you're going, but silencers are the exception. Of course, when you travel with them, you want to keep them in a lockbox or in your trunk. Um, you know, every state is different, especially when you're talking about like concealed carry and stuff like that, about where you can carry. So you just want to check the laws in that state, but generally it's going to be okay for you to travel with these as long as you have it in a lockbox. Another thing you can do is you can fly with these. Now it's gonna be subject to flying with any other firearm, right? You gotta have it in a TSA approved case and make sure that all the eyelets actually have a place for a lock, that the bag is going to be checked, okay? You can't carry it on the plane with you. And remember this, you know, even gun parts, you cannot take on a plane. I was talking to a guy at a Smith & Wesson event that we had recently, and he actually had a threaded FN barrel and he forgot that barrel was in his bag, and guess what, TSA took it. $500 barrel, gone, just like that. So any firearm, parts, ammo, anything, you have to make sure that stuff is checked and obviously in a TSA approved case. Now one thing you wanna keep in mind is when you check these bags, you don't want to handle these items at all until you get to the state where it's legal, meaning, if you're in a connecting flight, right, in a state where this stuff is illegal, they're going to move that bag from your initial flight 
to your connecting flight whenever that gets there, whenever that flight actually gets ready to leave. You don't wanna be handling that because if you're in a state where it's illegal and you try to check it again, they may deny you and you may have some serious issues on your hand. Now, I don't know about other flights, maybe you guys can tell me about those, but I've flown with Delta and they are really good about this. So when I leave from my airport where I'm traveling out of, that bag, I won't see it again until my final arrival place and then I'll pull my check bags off of the carousel there. And so I never see that bag again, so I don't really have to worry about it. That's the best case scenario. You just don't wanna have to recheck it and declare it to firearm or silencer in a state where it's illegal. Now, if you don't wanna go through this, you can mail a firearm and a suppressor to yourself. So this might be a better option for some of you if you don't trust TSA or checked bags or anything like that. You can have somebody that's out of state, you know, they would be the person that it's obviously directed to, but you are the only person that can actually open that item once you get to your place of arrival. But it's kind of convenient. You can use, uh, you know, UPS or FedEx to actually, you know, send yourself your own firearm, which is kind of cool if that's something that you want to do. Might be cheaper than doing a checked bag. It just really depends, and you might feel better about it, but you don't want to do that through USPS. You actually can't do that according to federal law. One thing you want to keep in mind is ready to certify. You do not want to miss this step because it's going to take a heck of a lot longer if you don't do this about five days after you do your initial paperwork and you bought the suppressor, tax stamp, all that kind of stuff, you'll get an email that's saying, hey, it's ready to certify. And so you can do this remotely with the FFL that has the uh, suppressor or wherever it's being transferred to, and then you just certify that paperwork and then it will officially be sent off. If you don't do this, it's going to take a lot longer or until you actually certify it, that's when the timer starts. And so it already takes long enough. Don't take up more time by not certifying it. Just look out for that email so you can go ahead and get that done. And then again, the timer starts. As far as how long it takes, it really depends on what's going on. Politics, all of this stuff plays into it. Right now though, it's about um, seven to 10 months. Uh, it could be up to a year. It always takes, you know, a, a little bit of time. One pro tip that I learned though, is if you buy one today and then you decide in three months you wanna buy another one, you could actually get both of those back at the same time. It's not a guarantee, but it is something that you could do for sure. If you want to make sure that you put these things in a trust, mm -hmm. do it from the beginning. Yeah, you gotta do it in the very beginning. Um, I've had an attorney draw up my trust. Uh, Silencer Shop does a great one. If I could go back and do it again, I, you know, shameless plug in their part, but uh, Silencer yeah. Shop does a great one for the money and it's simpler, it's easier to read. It's easier for you to fill out. A trust, a lot of people don't understand what a trust is. I know I didn't at the first time that I got it. A trust is a template that somebody writes on a word program that fills in the blanks. So it's a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo and then information about what's on the trust your information off your driver's license, and it's a couple of sheets of paper that you retain. It's kind of like you've created your own company and you're CEO of the company. Trustees are going to be employees on the company that can retain possession of the suppressor without your presence. So as an individual, only you can have it. I can go out shooting with you, but you can't loan it to me to go deer hunting. Okay. Um, so a trust is going to start out at uh, $25 is the cheapest entry way to get into it. Yeah. Uh, going up to about $125, $130 if you do silencer shop. There yeah. are two types of trusts. A single shot, which is basically a one-time trust, throw it away. If you need another suppressor, which you will, you'll buy another single shot trust. Okay. It's a little bit simpler and makes sense, although it's more paperwork. It's got less of your personal information on there. There's no photo associated with it. Uh, your Form 4 trust name will be the make, model, caliber of the suppressor, so you don't get to cool, choose a cool name right. in order to poke at the ATF like you can with a traditional trust. <laughs> but it makes more sense in my mind. I don't like to give the government more information than they need, okay. so I always take that route. If I could do it again, I would get single-shot trust. It makes more sense because this suppressor has its own trust. It's freestanding. This suppressor has its own trust. It's freestanding. Yep. The time you pass away, or if you want to give somebody or sell somebody a suppressor, you can say, here's a suppressor, it's got its own trust, you've been signed over to it. Gotcha. As opposed to having a traditional living trust with all your other stuff on there right. that you would have to provide to whoever gets signed on as a trustee. 
Um, now, single shot, you can add other people to it. Yes, so there's All no right. difference as far as uh, what you can and can't do with a suppressor. Um, or there's no difference in what you can and can't do as uh, putting people on, taking people off the truss. Okay. It's just one truss, one suppressor. You gotcha. cannot put another item on there. You would buy another single shot truss for another can. Right. Then that goes into the other type of truss, which is a, I would describe it as a living gun truss. So it's that same template with all the same information. It does have a picture of you on it um, for the approval, but you can keep putting suppressors on the same truss. So if you come up with a cool name for it, then you can have that. All the paperwork says that. Right. There's no real advantage to doing it that way anymore, I don't think. You can do an unlimited single shot truss for the same price as the living truss. It's 125 or 130 right there in that neighborhood. And uh, I would prefer to give the government less information and have a suppressor associated with every trust. It makes more sense. It is a larger stack of papers, sure. but it, uh, I prefer it that way. The other thing I want to talk about is the terminology. Is this a suppressor or is it a silencer? Well, when you look at the original creator, who is Hiram Percy Maxim, who is the son of Hiram Stevens Maxim, who made the Maxim machine gun, he originally designed and sold these as silencers. Actually, Theodore Roosevelt uh, bought Maxim silencers back in the day, which is pretty cool. Now, the NFA Act, 1934, they started regulating these, but it wasn't until 1985 with the U.S. patent where the word suppressor started being used. But when we look to modern times, the NRA and the American Silencer Association in 2011, they started pushing for, uh, you know, sports shooters. And now in modern times, the NRA and American Silencer Association in 2011 started pushing for regular people that whether it was self-defense or whether it was shooting or hunting or whatever to start owning suppressors. And so the whole idea was to eliminate the stigma that surrounds these. They even went to the extent the American Silencer Association changed their name from that to the American Suppressor Association because of politics, semantics. You know, politicians and news media, you know, start throwing around the word silencer and it's just like the assault rifle and AR type of conversation. AR does not stand for assault rifle, it stands for Armalite, but they will use those interchangeably because well, assault rifle, it sounds really scary, and so it's easy to drum up fear when you make them sound like that. And so anybody that's watched any number of movies or played video games knows that in those atmospheres where it's not real life, they make it seem like you can attach one of these and then 20 feet in the room right next to them, you won't be able to hear anything. Well, if you've ever shot with one of these, you know that's not true. Because there's three parts to the sound signature. You have the initial blast, then you have the sonic boom, and then you have, of course, the action. You're going to hear one of these three, uh, if not all of them, but the whole idea is to take the decibel rating down enough where it's safe for shooters uh, for hearing protection. Or, you know, not just at the range, if you're inside of your home. You know, letting off a 7.62 or a 5.56 or any number of rounds, any round really, inside of your home uh, is going to lead to some type of hearing damage if you ever have to use your gun in self-defense. And so on that level, suppressor is a more accurate term to describe these. I use them interchangeably, and I know I've done it in this video, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I understand that, you know, a silencer does not necessarily silence the entire gun and it doesn't work like it does in movies. And so I think the technical term is suppressor, but you'll hear people use them interchangeably. Silencer Shop is one of the biggest places out there and they have silencer in their name. And so uh, semantics wise, I would use suppressor and that will uh, just shut some people up. And now you have some information that you can use as to why it's a suppressor. It's kind of like assault rifle and AR all of that kind of stuff. That's why the terminology matters. Those are some of the most important tips that I think when you're buying your first suppressor, things you need to know, things to make this process easier and go a lot smoother for you. If you have any others you wanna leave down below, make sure you do that or any opinions you wanna give about owning a suppressor or anything like that. I may use those in a part two if you guys like this video. And again, if you like what I do, consider subscribing. You could also join us on Patreon or join the channel right here. 
and never have to leave YouTube. Big thanks to you guys for watching. See you in the next one. And as always, holding down.